another, another whole nother level. And that's what I want to talk about today is how the, God the Father interacts with people. So, um, as I said, you know, we, we've talked about the kids and everything, but 2,000 years ago, God interacted with some people, and that's what we want to go through today, and he is still interacting with us, and if you have your Bibles, open them up to Luke chapter 1, and we're going to read 26 through 28, how God interacted with Mary, and obviously it's going to be up here, Luke chapter 1, verse 26, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel, everybody say angel, Angel. Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary, She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come into this time of your word, Lord, we give you praise for our children. We thank you, Father God, for our children and our grandchildren, Lord, and and how you want to move through them, and Lord, how you want us to interact with them, how you want them to see God in us. And Lord, how we want to see you. We want to have an encounter with you and we want to interact with you. I pray, Father God, that we would all leave this place uplifted today from being in your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want to talk about four or five ways that God still interacts with us today. And the way he interacted then, he still does today. Like I said, you know, when you bring your tithes and offerings, it's just like the wise men bringing their offering to the Lord. It's the same thing. It's happened then. It still goes on today. But number one, God interacted through an angel, a ministering spirit. And we read right there how the angel of the Lord came to Mary and he shared with her. You know, and if you read that whole account, Mary was a little taken back, a little astonished when when he said to her, greetings, favored woman, the Lord is with you. And and it kind of caught her off guard, you know. I mean, some stranger walks up to you, and he says, Kathy, he says, greetings, Kathy, your favored woman of God, the Lord is with you. You you know, somebody walks up and does that to you. Now you're kind of like, what do you want? You know, you kind of like... What's going on? You know, we're we're so guarded. You know, but Mary, she interacted with the angel, and and God just spoke miraculous things to her. You're going to have a child, and this is what's going to happen. And he went down the line with her, and then surely her, her response was, let it be as you've said. You know, and and we're not just talking about just having a baby. We're talking about having the Son of God, but we're also talking about what she was about to go through was punishable by death. To get pregnant out of wedlock, that's punishable by death in these days. And, and she's, she just said, Lord, let it be as you said. I'll put my life on the line for what you're saying right now. It's powerful what she did, the statement she made in her willingness. But God still has angels at work today. We read in Genesis chapter 28 about Jacob's ladder, how the angels went up and down the ladder, that the Lord was at the top sending ministering spirits to the people. How many of you have ever encountered an angel? How many of you think you might have encountered an angel and you weren't sure? On 9-11... That day in September, an FBI agent, Lily Lenardi, um, she's retired from post-traumatic stress after 9-11, and she refrained to tell her story in fear of being ostracized until 2012. She reported that her inner, she told her inner circle that she began to see a light that was blinding that day. All at once, the mist took full shape, and I saw what appeared to be angels. There were angels standing in the open area to the left of the crash site. There were hundreds of them standing in columns. There was a field of angels emerging from the realms of the mist. They were archangels with their wings arched up toward the sky. She was afraid to tell her, 
co-workers about that story because a lot of people wouldn't believe it. I remember I, I shared this last Sunday even. My, my grandson Micah, when he was two years old, he was, he was in here on Good Friday, right before Easter. And he was just so excited because he saw angels in the balcony. He was so excited because he's seeing there was nobody. I mean, I didn't see anything in the balcony. Me and my faded eyes, I guess. <laughs> but he saw it. And it was amazing because when it came Sunday, Easter Sunday morning, and he's looking, he's looking, he's two years old, he's looking for the angels in the balcony. And they weren't there. Man, I felt like angels in the outfield. Should we start? Should we wait till they show up? What should we do right now? I mean, because he, I know that he saw them in the balcony. He was so excited. So I know that, you know, innocent eyes can still see them angels, Abe. Hey? Hallelujah. You know, but Psalms 91 verse 11 tells us this. It says, for he, God, will command his angels concerning you, to guard you in all your ways. That's what the Bible tells us. That he sends his angels to guard us in all our ways. And, and I, I think about, Bob, I think about when I was hiding in the attic in that foreign country and the police were searching the room, but they never opened the attic door. It's like God blinded them, like angels had that door blocked. They searched that room twice, the police did, but nobody ever opened the attic door. It was right there. I thought, we're idiots for hiding in here. The door's right there, and nobody thought to open the door. I just think angels had to be guarding me, amen? You know, and I know I've been in places where angels had to protect me. I've had people say, what in the world are you doing on that side of the world? doing what I do, man, just sharing Jesus. I said, don't you know it's dangerous there? And I said, no, I don't, because I know that God is with you. I believe this. He's got angels that guard you. You were in a car accident a little over a year ago that it should have just tore you up, told your car, and you walked away. Angels all around us guarding us. And then, see, it says in, in um, Matthew 18, it says, See that you do not despise one of these little ones. One of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Their angels. They have angels around them that God sends to them. And then in Psalms 34, verse 7, it says, The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. That's a promise to us. The angels of the Lord are encamped around about us to those that fear him. So if you have a fear of the Lord, you have angels that surround you is what the word declares. And I receive that. I, I, you know what? I would never say, Miss Maggie, I would never say, I don't believe it. I would never say that. Because, man, I need all the help I can get. <laughs> And so when he, when he says, the angels encamp around about me, man, I receive that. I receive that they're around me. I receive that they're for me, that they're here to help me. Amen? And then it goes on in Hebrews chapter 13. It says, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for th thereby some have entertained angels unaware. You know... <laughs> That, that's sometimes I wonder, is that, is that it? Should I stop? Should I, you know, should I roll down my windows? Should I talk to this guy? Is this an angel? I, you know, you just wonder, you know, should I make time? Should I not be so quick to rush off from somebody? Is it an opportunity that God is wanting to bless me with? See, but sometimes, you know, we see somebody coming because we think of an angelic being, Mom, as somebody tall, white, you know, dressed in white and wings. And, you know, we, we have this... Uh, conceived idea of what they look like and stuff, but to somebody to walk up and maybe it's just an average normal guy just comes up, wants to greet you and talk with you and stuff. So you never know when you're entertaining angels. And then it goes on in Hebrews 1 verse 14, it says, are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? So angels come to serve, to help us. 
And nothing has changed. In the same way that God sent an angel to Mary, he's still doing it today. He's doing it to guard you, that the little ones have their angels, their guardian angels. He encamps around those who fear him. You entertain angels, and angels come to serve. So in the same way it happened back then, it still happens today. As I read you that account of that FBI agent. Number two, God interacts with us through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, and, and to me this is just, this is a miracle that totally breaks the laws of nature. I mean, that's a miracle. When something breaks, destroys the laws of nature. Is verse, Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now that is incredible. That is incredible. I don't know of anybody that would buy that story today. We wouldn't buy that story. It's like, you're lying. You know, we'd be like, we're going to go to the doctor and you're going to get checked. You know, <laughs> I mean, that's what we do. We, we, we just can't, we couldn't believe it. We couldn't receive it. It'd be like, no, that's just nuts. It's, it doesn't happen like that. Jesus, you know, Jesus only came once. But see, then the penalty, as I said, was death. They take you out and they stone you to death when you have a, get pregnant out of wedlock. That was the idea there. But God, through the Holy Spirit, planted the seed in the woman. And God is still planting seed today. Now, the wonderful thing about the Holy Spirit is that when you believe in Jesus, he sends the Holy Spirit to you. He sends the Holy Spirit to you. John says, he says, the Holy Spirit was with you. He says, but now the Holy Spirit will be in you, it's in us. So he goes, everywhere I go, Rick, everywhere go, whether I'm going home, I'm going to the church, or I'm going shopping, Bob, or I'm going to, to China, or I'm going to Pakistan, or I'm going to, you know, um, where's the other place I'm going? I'm going to Peru, I'm going to India, you know, God always goes with me, amen? The Holy Spirit is always with me. He said he'll never, everybody say never. never. He'll never leave me, and he'll never forsake me. He's always with me, he's always in me. And sometimes we may not feel him, we may not sense him, and I think sometimes we don't feel him and sense him because of what we're doing. He may not ever leave us or forsake us, but we may grieve him by our actions. But the Holy Spirit comes and he puts a seed of fruit in us. He gives us the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. He puts all that fruit inside of us. It's like when you have the Holy Spirit, you're filled with love. And now we just need to let it grow, amen? We need to walk in love. We need to be gentle. We need to be kind. We need to be so loving and faithful and, and have self-control. Because we have the Holy Spirit in us, now we have the ability by the Spirit of God to choose to be loving. I can love everybody. I can love people that don't like me. Hallelujah. And I can be faithful. I can have self-control. I don't have to have outbursts of anger and wrath. I have self-control, amen? Because I have the fruit of what God, God has put in me by the Holy Spirit. He even speaks through us. He works through us. He, he gives us dreams. The Holy Spirit just speaks to us and, and, and causes us to want to be better men and women and children. He speaks to us, number three, through dreams. How many of you like that wall we put up this week? Ah, hallelujah. Danny, Danny Whistler and I, the camera guy, the guy on the camera right now, just got crazy and just did it this week. But I, I was wondering, I, I'm like, how are we going to get this cut to make it all flow and look like the picture? You know, you want to build something, you always want to be, 
You want it to look like the design, and, and Greg Lucky, Jaden's father, designed it for us and looked at the picture, and I thought, man, I really want to make it right. And so when I got up the other day, we had, we had done all the straight part, and it was like all we had to do is the top three rows from the vent on a cross. And I'm like, Lord, how are we going to cut all that, get a line? I mean, Danny's like, we could chalk line it. And I'm thinking, how are we going to chalk line? It's a round wall, you know. And, and the Lord just showed me in a vision, in a dream, on Friday morning. And I got here and said, this will take us a half hour. This is so easy. And man, bam, 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 we were done. God still gives dreams and he gives visions on how to accomplish things, on what he wants you to do, amen? He gave Joseph a dream. Look at this, in verse 19, he said, Joseph, her fiancé, was a good man and did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save the people from their sins. God spoke to him so clearly in a dream. And I think a lot of us have dreams, but we don't know that they're from God. Sometimes we have pizza dreams. You know, we eat pizza at night before we go to bed, and, and then we're having these crazy wild dreams in the middle of the night. And you wake up in the morning, and you say, God, was that you? And he says, no, that was a pizza you ate last night. We, have, we do have those dreams, but sometimes God sends you dreams from above to speak into your life, to give you direction. I know I, I had a dream recently, and, uh, you know, because I, I talk a lot from this pulpit on how we should talk. I spend a lot of time talking about how, how as Christians we need to talk. And I'm not talking about not cursing and, you know, using foul language. I'm not even talking about that. But I'm talking about is I spend a lot of time talking about speaking the word of God over our lives instead of how we feel. Because when we, when we speak how we feel, if it's contrary to the word of God, the Bible says your tongue, our tongue, produces death or it produces life. So when I'm talking, if I speak what God says about me, I'm speaking life. Now, he said that Jesus took all my sin and all my sickness to the cross. So I'm forgiven of all my sins. So I don't have to talk about, my. I don't have to stay stuck in the things I've done in the past. Because I'm forgiven of those things. Jesus doesn't remember them. God the Father doesn't even see them. Because when you come to Jesus, he washes you clean of that stuff. He forgives you of all your sins. And it's like racing it. Turn the, turn the um, screen off. Can you? Not, not, the, not the thing, but can you make it go blank for a minute? You can't, you see the white on the side? <laughs> it's white. That's your life when you come to Jesus. It's white. It's pure. It's like you've never sinned before. When you come to Jesus, you repent of your sins, recognize that you have sinned. You got to recognize, I, I've sinned. And so when I come to Jesus and I said, hey, forgive me of my sins, cleanse me from this junk, I want to serve you. Now you've, it's like you've erased the board. And now you're pure. So when you become pure, the thing is, that's how God sees me, Alexandria. God sees me as pure. You can turn it back on. He doesn't see my junk anymore. But, you know, I remember when I came to the Lord and even, you know, becoming a pastor and stuff and getting together with family members and, you know, I think, I don't think they realize what I do, family members, that I'm a pastor, that I... I get up and I speak, I travel the world and I speak and I share Jesus with people. I don't think they understand all that. Because what they do is they try to bring up the stuff I did when I was a kid. The junk, the things, the negative things that I did. 
I mean, for a long time, it's like, there are some family members I didn't want to be around because all they wanted to talk about was the junk. It's like, I, I'm so far past that junk 20, 30 years ago. I don't want to, I don't want to sit around and hash that out, bring that up. I'm done with that. See, so people don't forget, but God does. God's like, wow, you're golden. You are pure. And that's the idea when we come to Jesus. And so when we are walking, you know, into dreams, God wants to give you dreams for your future, of what he's intending for you, what he wants you to do. He's not, he's not trying to, he's not up there going, let's see, how can I make Maria's life miserable? <laughs> that's not God. That's your enemy, the devil. God's up there going, how can I bless Maria? How can I dream? This mic keeps cutting out. Am I okay? Do I need a battery? <laughs> need some energy? <laughs> my, my battery pack needs a, a monster. <laughs> up there. So, but, but God's idea is to give you a dream, Conrad. Something to look for. And that's what he did with Joseph. He said, hey, don't put Mary away. I've done this thing. And then, you know, when you follow that dream that God has for you, it's amazing what God will do. When you follow after what God is showing you, it's amazing. He gave me a dream one time. He said, step out in faith. And I was on a roof in my dream. I stepped out in faith, and the Lord took me somewhere. It was amazing. When, when you step out in faith in the life, and you believe what God has said about you, what he's showing you, it's amazing what he'll do. So God is still giving dreams today, amen? He still wants us to understand and, um, and obtain what he's created us for. So we, God interacts through angels. God interacts through the Holy Spirit. God interacts through dreams. And lastly, God interacts through his word. He's given us the Old Testament, which pointed to Jesus. Everything in the Old Testament is leading us to Jesus. And now that we have the New Testament, now that we've experienced Christ through the Word, now we're living for Jesus. And the, the New Testament is describing life in Christ. So now we can thrive and not just survive. How many of you have been just surviving lately? It's time to thrive in the Lord. It's time to just get, get going with God and be excited about who He is and start living the way He's called us to. As we've been going through the book of James, we've seen in the book of James that believers in Jesus would go through trials. How many of you have been in some trials lately? See, we're believers, but yet we still go through trials. But what James has tried to do is he tried to give us instruction on how to go through trials. Instructions how to live through trials. Instructions how to love through trials. Instruction on how to glorify God even in the midst of your trial. And sometimes that's hard. I, I look at my sister Margaret who lost a son two weeks ago and she hasn't missed a Sunday. She's been here every day, every time, just glorifying God even in the midst of a heartbreaking trial. She's still pressing through. And that's awesome. But God, who's rich in grace and mercy, has given us a way to overcome the things of this world. First thing he tells us that we can overcome by is by the blood of the Lamb, which is Jesus, and the word of our testimony. Open up, share what Jesus is doing in your life. Amen? You say, well, he's not doing anything. Well, then... Get together with him. Because when you're walking with Jesus, he'll do something in your life. I remember watching, I was watching a movie yesterday. It was that movie Gravity. Sandra Bullock. She's in a spaceship all alone. And she's trying to figure out how to get back to earth. And she just resided to, I'm going to die. And she sits back in her chair. And she starts crying and she says, somebody pray for my soul. Somebody pray for my soul. I've never been taught how to pray for my own soul. That's what she said in the movie. And I thought, 
I wonder how many people have never been taught to pray for your own soul. That when the rubber meets the road, when it comes down to the end of our life, to where we're going to spend eternity. Are we going to spend it in heaven as his word declares? And I believe in heaven and hell. And I believe that we make the decision where we spend eternity. And I believe that God, he does speak to us through angels. He interacts with through angels. He interacts through, um, what did I say, through dreams, through the Holy Spirit, and through his word so that we don't have to question where we're going to spend eternity. So that we can go to Jesus and know where we're going to spend eternity. Mark 16, 15, it says, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be baptized, and you'll be saved. Don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll be condemned. See, people say, well, God is a... I hear people say, God's a mean God. No, God would never send anybody to hell. It's true, God doesn't have to send anybody to hell. Because you and I, we decide where we're going to spend eternity. We decide if we're going to go to heaven. We decide if we're not going to go to heaven. It's all up to us because Jesus did his part. He came. He was born as a baby in a manger. He came as the Son of God, born to Mary the Virgin, all for the purpose of trying to bring us life. He did bring life to us. He said, I'm going to pay for everything you've ever done wrong, for every sickness and disease on the cross. He says, I'm going to lay down my life for you. And if you believe in me that I've done that for you, you'll not perish either, but you'll have everlasting life. He makes it really simple. Just surrender your life to me. Surrendering your life to Jesus is, is very simple in the fact that you just have to realize, number one, that you sin. How many of you sin? Talking to the right crowd. And then we repent of our sin. When we repent of our sin, it's, it's more than just saying, I'm sorry. It's turning away from it. It's like you come to the altar, you speak your sin out. I've done this, 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 and this, and I leave it with you. And you go out and you go and do it no more. That's what repenting means. You make a 180 degree turn. You were going this way and now you're not. Now you're going God's way. That's repentance. And then you come in, then you just receive forgiveness. It just comes to you, forgiveness. You receive healing because that's the promise. If you believe, you'll be, you'll be healed, you'll be saved, you're forgiven of your sins. God's, it's God's desire to interact with us through his angels, through his Holy Spirit, through dreams through his word.